welcome to this whistle-stop tour of our BAUS FRCS Role Fiverr Preparation Course. This is one of a number of educational courses run by BAUS. We have about 70 faculty who come and help uh, throughout the week, from doing their presentations to helping out with the mock examinations in the afternoon. It's a fantastic opportunity, working with your knowledge, building the skills you have, building the knowledge you have and getting into a point where you can deliver it at an expert level in an exam setting. You get to meet people from other regions, a bit of networking, just generally making you feel comfortable by the time you finish the course that yes, you're ready to do the exam. And the experts have given us great lectures all week, um, knowing those key up-to-date research and guidelines getting us to the point of uh, being consultant urologists. The structure of the course actually is absolutely brilliant because it allows you to learn in the, in the morning and then you get grilled in the afternoon. Um, very focused lectures in the morning and excellent vibe practice in the afternoon. It's fun, you get along with people, you get to practice lots. It's a great opportunity to see all the stuff here and all my colleagues uh, in the background shop. And uh, we learned a lot. The vibers were handled expertly um, and it was probably the most useful thing I could have done really. Really, really good from the faculty. So during the week we've had excellent viva support, sort of coaching, how do you get that extra mark? I've learned quite a lot from other people so I think that's been invaluable. Um, I wasn't lucky enough to get on the course myself when I was a registrar, which I think is a real shame because towards the end of the week they really do become quite slick at answering five questions. This is a fun interactive week to help trainees organise and present the information. If you need a course like this to stimulate and remind yourself of the information that's already in there. It's quite obvious that the people who start off on a Monday are completely different than how they are on the Friday. It's bloody hard work, but in the end it's one of the best courses I've ever been on. Very much worth it for everyone to do. It's a busy, exhausting week. It's absolutely worth it. Highly recommend it. Is essential for anyone trying to do the FRCS. I would definitely recommend it to anyone. Excellent course. I definitely recommend it. It's been a real pleasure to help some of these candidates along the way. Hello everyone, my name is Katie Chan and I'm an ST6 Urology Reg in the Southwest Deanery and previous communications officer of the BAU section of trainees. Myself and my co-chair Claire Jelly are delighted to welcome you to our BSALT session, Being a Urologist and a Parent. It sounds really very cliche to say, but being a mum is really great, um, but it is also very, very hard. Um, and it turns out lots of other people feel the same. And even if you're not a parent or planning on being a parent, you may work alongside or supervise people who are. So what we wanted to do today was to open up this conversation, talk about the things that were easy and the things that were less easy. I'm really grateful for our faculty, all of whom are really passionate about this session, and many of whom will be sharing experiences that are really very close to them. Claire and I have prepared some questions for each lecture, but please do ask via the chat function if we haven't covered something and we will attempt to answer live on screen when this airs. So without further ado, I introduce our first speaker, Susan Hall, who will be talking about pregnancy and urology. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm an ST6 trainee from the East Midlands. I'm going to be talking to you all a bit about my experience as um, a pregnant urologist, the experience of some of my colleagues that I've been speaking to, and also the evidence behind some of the things that we need to consider when we're pregnant and working. So to start with my experience. So at 12 weeks and one day pregnant, I rang the clinical supervisor to my next rotation, knowing that in a number of months time, I'd be going off on maternity leave and wanting to give as much notice as I could do. Um, obviously had the, the normal conversation that you have and then talked to him about this scenario and the, the, the fact that I was pregnant. And the first thing that he said and pretty much the only thing that he said was, well, I'm a stone surgeon, so you're not going to be able to operate with me, and we do a lot of stones here. And it completely took me aback and made me realise I don't know the evidence behind whether or not I could do screening procedures, and clearly my educational supervisor doesn't know either. Um, so that triggered me off to have a bit of a look into the research, which I'm going to take you through um, later. But going through me and my experience, then went ahead with my pregnancy. I was very lucky that my pregnancy was straightforward, um, rotated, 
And when I rotated, I ended up commuting um, at weekends, living away from home. Um, I continued my normal shifts. I continued my on-call shifts and planned in my head, oh, it's great. I'm going to be fine. I'm a type A personality. It'll be all right. Just pregnancy. It doesn't make you sick. And I worked till 39 weeks. That's something, you know, uh, I'll be fine. Um, and then the hottest summer hits and I am in a DGH two hours from home. It's a Saturday. I'm doing a ward round with an F1. And unfortunately, week 36, I have an APH on a ward round. And obviously that started my return to leave early. Um, luckily, everything was okay. Um, and skip forward three years, I now have a three-year-old that comes charging into the room to me saying, mommy, I've colored myself in. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's obviously a lot of a lot of stuff that's happened in that time. Um, but that's a bit of a background, a bit about me and, and, and my pregnancy and my experience. So I went away and asked a bit about um, other people's experience. And obviously this is a really personal thing. It's your body, it's your pregnancy, it's also your training and training across the country uh, is quite variable. So um, I asked a few questions. The first thing was, did the trainees get an individual risk assessment? And that's something I'll talk you through um, a bit later in the talk, but it's something that there's a legal requirement and all of them did get that. How many uh, weeks gestation did people work to? And that was obviously hugely variable. Uh, and the people that have worked through COVID, which I'll talk you through, um, have often finished at 28 weeks. When did people stop on calls? And this surprised me a bit that actually people have maybe very sensibly decided to finish their on calls a little bit earlier. And I didn't realize that some um, uh, trusts in the country have actually have a protocol on when 24 hour on calls should be stopped during pregnancy. Uh, and in one place that was 26 weeks. Did you continue screening during your pregnancy? And yes, 100% of people did. And we'll talk behind the evidence for that shortly. Were you able to make your own decisions about your pregnancy and your working life? Um, it's great to see that 100% of people said yes. And there were a lot of positive answers to this. Um, and I haven't got time here to, to, to sort of share with you all the details, but there were a couple of bits of people saying yes, they did, but they felt guilty. Obviously, um, with the NHS being as it is, if we go off or we go part time, there isn't necessarily someone else to fill in that gap. So it puts pressure on our colleagues um, who are already stretched. Um, and so that there is quite a few people that said to me, yes, they, they felt guilty about it. One person had a great experience and had a sit down weekly review during their pregnancy about how their training and pregnancy were going along uh, sort of together. Um, I asked about where people got advice from. And a lot of people said um, other trainees, um, asked other people that were pregnant, medics who were pregnant. One person said they had looked at literature. Um, and then finally, did you get any negative reactions about being a pregnant trainee? And unfortunately, 80% of people said they did. I don't think this is necessarily the forum for me to share the details on that. Um, and that's probably something that's not isolated to urology or surgery or medicine, uh, but it's something I did want to, to put on here. So I'm gonna take you through the evidence now. And the first thing I want to say is that the actual evidence behind the practical things we need to do as a urologist and its associated risks during pregnancy is limited. The data that is out there is based on small retrospective non-randomized trials. Um, and so although I'm going to tell you what the evidence shows, it's all published and um, I do think it's really important everyone makes their own, their own decision uh, regarding these things. So the first thing screening, because obviously that was the thing that popped out to me when I first uh, told my, my supervisor that I was pregnant. So just a bit of background. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the, the, a bit about radiation. So the millisievert is essentially a, uh, a measure of the health effect of radiation and what it has on the human body. So in general, anyone in the public, anyone, any late, anyone will get a background radiation and that will be about two to three millisieverts per year. Now, the Health and Standards um, Agency advise that a pregnant person should not receive more than one millisievert per year on top of the background radiation. Now, just to put that into perspective a bit, for a non-pregnant 
medic, they suggest 20 millisieverts on top of the background radiation. So it's quite a lot less. But actually the evidence behind or, or the research behind whether we're actually being exposed to more than that or whether the fetus is being exposed to more than that shows actually that the fetus is pretty safe as long as you've got a lead gown on. So the British Institute of Radiology said that nearly 99% of all medics, med clinical medics, receive less than one millisiever annually. Uh, there was a study where vascular trainees put a dosimeter underneath their lead gown onto the, um, onto the uh, sort of onto the uterus, and this showed negligible radiation to the fetus. One study showed that there were higher radiation dose at home, actually, compared to doing a half day screening list at work. Um, and then the biggest study, which is still relatively small, but 534 pregnant interventional radiologists and their outcomes with pregnancy. And they all continued to screen throughout. And it showed no difference in the fetal outcomes between them and the general population. Other things as urologists we need to have a bit of a think about. Um, the first one is mitomycin. This one's fairly obvious to all of us. We know that it's cyt um, cytotoxic, tetratogenic, mutagenic, and particularly during the first trimester, this is something we should avoid. I think it's uh, in most situations, particularly as a trainee, it's not unreasonable to ask somebody else to do the mitomycin. And certainly that's advised by the drug companies to not come into contact with that. And hopefully, usually as a trainee, or, or even if you weren't a trainee, there would be someone else that could administer that for you. The next two bits are bits that I didn't know about at all, and quite a few of the people I asked didn't know about. Um, the first one is that a 5-alpha reductase, such as finasteride, can actually affect the development of the external genitalia in a male fetus. Um, that being said, you do need to handle crushed finasteride with your bare hands. Um, finasteride is normally coated and boxed, and being more on the medical side than the nursing side, we hardly ever handle it, but we shouldn't be handling it whilst we're pregnant. Uh, and the last thing is iodine hand scrub. So when you actually do a whole list of cases and you use iodine hand scrub, it, is, uh, then it can then be found in the urine, in your urine after the uh, list. And it, it is known to cause, potentially cause problems with the development of the fetal thyroid. So use chlorhexidine um, wherever you can. And if it's not there, just ask for it. Most places have chlorhexidine as well as iodine. Infections, obviously um, this is a, a big thing at the moment and I've got a separate slide on, on COVID-19, um, but particular things to urology. So if a pregnant lady has not had chicken pox, then if she gets chicken pox during her pregnancy, she can potentially be much more poorly with it. So if you happen to get a patient come in with loin pain and it was shingles, then you would need to be careful, careful with that. Hepatitis B and HIV cases are cases that really we should probably be avoiding doing in terms of theatre cases um, during our pregnancy, particularly hepatitis B as it has a high transmission rate to the fetus. And then other infections particularly should be avoided during pregnancy include cytomegalovirus, parvovirus, toxoplasmosis, and listeria. Now, in my, in my experience as a trainee, these aren't things I've come across often, but we should be aware. And I, I don't, I would hope that most of us wouldn't come across any difficulty if we asked someone else to maybe operate on a patient that was um, hepatitis positive, for example. Now, COVID-19, I um, looked mainly at both the NHS and the Royal College of Obs and Gynae advice on this and it did differ slightly. Um, the NHS seemed to be more towards um, anyone in the general public or lay people whereas the RCOG was a little bit more sort of medical in its language. Now the NHS said that pregnant ladies are at moderate risk of um, COVID-19 and they said that was because pregnant ladies are more at risk of catching the virus such as a flu and therefore they assumed we'd be higher chance of catching COVID. They've said that it is possible to pass COVID onto your fetus, but where that has happened, and it has been known to happen, the fetus has recovered well. And they've said there's no evidence that COVID-19 increases miscarriage or developmental problems. Now, the Royal College of Obs, uh, Obs uh, and Gynae said that um, there's no evidence that uh, pregnant women are at a higher risk of contracting the virus, which obviously goes against what the NHS had said. Um, and then we all know that 
one piece of advice that did come out that seemed to be strong advice, strong guidance that we can actually get hold of that wasn't so if, but maybe uh, and a, a little bit more sort of rigid was that over 28 weeks, if a lady were to catch coronavirus, then she may well be much more severely ill with it. And at that point, a lot of trainees then, then took that on and decided with their supervisors to become non-patient facing at that point. Um, and actually it's not necessarily too difficult with us doing telephone clinics um, and that sort of thing. Um, although shortly after, I think the, uh, the RCOG then actually slightly withdrew that and said that it's up to the individual trust to guide the protocol. And so, again, unfortunately, it's made it a little bit more um, le le uh, sort of less rigid and a little bit more up to each trust. And that, I think we all know that each trust and, and everybody really in the NHS is, is struggling a bit with the, with the situation that we're in. Then I want to talk to you a bit about um, working as a urologist uh, whilst pregnant. We can talk about screening and infections, but actually the thing that's really big to us is the fact that we work really long hours, we're stressed, we have low resources or, or potentially have low resources at times. Um, and this can have major impacts on us and our babies. So psychosocial maternal stress is known to cause neuropsychiatric cardiovascular and metabolic disease later life. We know that working long hours has been proven to increase chance of preterm birth and low birth weight. In terms of what the actual guidelines or laws are around working life and the regulations whilst you're pregnant, um, there's advice that we should, or, or we pregnant uh, trainees or pre pregnant urologists should tell their employer that they're pregnant by the 25th week. Now that's not a legal requirement, but if we don't do that, then we can't expect the employer to put into place any, any uh, changes that we might need. There is, however, a legal requirement to have an individualized risk assessment. Now, everyone that I asked got that, so then I had to ask for that, and it may, it may end up forming you and your supervisor in the office ticking some boxes, or it may be more of a formal um, risk assessment. So I think it's something that you need to take, um, sort of take ownership of and, and make sure that that happens. Now, um, the health standards agency said, um, have said that if they have an employee that is pregnant, the official line is that they should reduce risk with manual handling. Now we've all had manual handling training as we know, um, uh, provide rest facilities, which I think most of us have access to in terms of an office or a mess or somewhere to sleep if we're on call. Um, and that night work should be reduced, which I think is probably with a lot of us doing 24 hours on call, um, something that some people have obviously decided to finish on calls a little bit early. The NHS states that um, employers um, should, if the, if the uh, pregnant employer employee is likely to stand for more than three hours, alternative work should be offered. Now, practically, I think that's potentially a bit tricky. If you do a long ward round and then you're doing a theatre list where you're standing up most of the time, that's quite tricky. Um, they've also said that you should reduce long working hours as far as possible. So again, no specific numbers, but um, well, they've said to less than 40 hours per week. Now, um, I sort of totted up just roughly how many I'm working at the moment. And that's obviously a lot less than a lot of us are working. And we could well go to our individualized risk assessment meeting and say, look, the NHS says that my hours should be reduced to 40. I think if we were to do that, that would potentially be suggesting we'd end up working part time. And we all know what pressure that puts on our colleagues. So that might be something that's difficult for us to do, but we are within our right to do. Um, they do put a caveat at the end there, which I've not put on this slide. And there's a sentence at the end that says there is not sufficient evidence to say that working more than 40 hours is a detrimental to your child. And therefore, they cannot uh, make this uh, sort of a legal requirement. So they can't enforce that. So finally, what does this all mean in reality? Well, I think the most important thing here is clear communication. Have somebody at work, whether it's your TPD, your supervisor, um, or another um, uh, probably more senior person than yourself at work that you can talk to, and talk to them as early as possible about how you would like 
to do things during your pregnancy and have a think in advance about when you might want to stop on calls, for example. If you've got an operative case that's maybe a long cystectomy that's going to take five hours, you could maybe ask another trainee if they would mind swapping with you and you could do a list of uh, transperineal biopsies or something that's a bit shorter. Um, lead gowns. So I talked about the fact that it's potentially um, uh, safe for your fetus and it wouldn't be exposed to radiation, but lead gowns weigh about 11 kilos, um, which if you're doing a long case, that's going to cause potentially back pain. And we already know that pregnant ladies are at risk of back pain. So choose a one piece lead gown, maybe choose a non-lead lead gown. So they're about four kilos lighter. And a lot of places do have those. And I think if you ask for them, they may have one or two of them kept sort of hidden away, but you could potentially ask for that. Also make sure in terms of practical things that your lead gown is covering the sides of your gravid uterus, as a lot of them have a split down the side and you wouldn't want um, anything to get across there. And then of course PPE, we all know about PPE at the moment, but we really need to be wearing that at the moment and always particularly. Um, obviously that does pose uh, things about being over, uh, a lot of ladies were saying they were really hot with wearing the masks on, um, but I think that's crucial that we do that. So I think there's um, quite a bit of information there. This is clearly a really personal uh, topic. Everybody's pregnancy and everybody's body and work life is different. So I'm hoping this will generate some questions and some discussion. Thank you. Lizzie, that was really great. Um, has anyone got any questions they'd like to kick us off with? Yeah, Claire. I just wondered, I know it's a personal thing, but when in reflection, when you thought you should have gone off, or if you were to have your time again, what time, and with all the information that you know, what sort of average time you think is reasonable with the balance of training opportunities, but tiredness that you haven't really touched on. I know my sister was in bed at eight o'clock every night. Trying to balance yeah. that and actually what you can take from opportunities because you're shattered all the time, because you're growing something. And I personally myself, if I were to have another child, I would really, I would certainly stop on calls earlier um, and um, potentially think about starting my maternity leave a little bit earlier. I don't know if that's the reason this happened, but there was nothing else going on with my pregnancy. I don't know, obviously, but I would certainly do things differently. And I think as a sweeping generalisation as surgeons, and maybe again, sweeping generalization as female surgeons, we are typically type A personalities, want to work really hard, never give up, always push. And definitely for me, if this were to happen again, I would need to take a step back and say, this isn't about me now. I know I can push through this, but actually um, there's, there's somebody else involved here and I need to ease off for them. Um, but obviously finishing a bit earlier is gonna impact on training, but. I guess you have to weigh that up with the fact that you've got another life there um, and that's that you're only going to be pregnant with that child once. Touching on a similar sort of thing, I completely feel the same as you in that whole, you know, type A thing. This is how I want to go about it. This is what I have in my mind. I'm going to work until this date, blah, blah, blah. Is there anything anyone could have said to you at that time that would have made you change your mind? No, um, but I actually, even after the APH <coughs> stop until they said you need to stop working now. Um, so no, but I think that's a very personal thing in your, in your personality. Maybe actually, if I'd have heard this talk, I don't just mean mine, I mean, generally this whole talk today, it, um, it probably would have changed my mind. Or if I'd have had more of a conversation with other trainees that, or other surgeons that have been that have been pregnant and talked more about it, yeah. uh, it might have done. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, know. did you have a question? Yeah, stop. So. Sorry, Katie. No, 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 no please. <laughs> Um, but Susie, first of all, thank you so much. That was really interesting, really informative. And so from my perspective, as a man who has clearly not been pregnant, who, clearly, who doesn't have any children, I mean, it's really interesting to hear about all the issues that I wouldn't have even considered um, that, you know, that you face when you're, when, you, when you're pregnant. So it's a bit of a personal question and feel free to, to, to tell me, to tell me it's, uh, it's inappropriate. But, you know, you mentioned that 80% of pregnant trainees, whether that's in urology or otherwise, receive 
um, negative feedback or negative reactions for, for, for being pregnant. So I'm just quite interested really to know what are some of the examples of, of this negative, these negative comments or, uh, and what would, you, what would your advice be to trainees to try and overcome these or to try and make things easier for these trainees that may be in a similar situation? Um, I think a lot of the comments were comments that had come back before people have necessarily spent time thinking about what they were going to say or how it's going to be taken on. And they're based on the fact that we are all so stretched. So the comments were things like, well, who's going to do you on calls when you stop doing on calls? Um, well, if you go on maternity leave that early, we haven't got another trainee to take your place. Um, and I think that's really difficult because of course if we could if we could give the NHS more resources and more surgeons and more staff then that would, would help with a lot of that but I think try not to take it if if and when that happens and that might happen not necessarily to do with pregnancy but any part of our training or our career take a pause listen to what the person's saying think about why they're saying it they're not saying it because they're cross that you're pregnant they're saying it because they're already stressed and tired so listen to them and say right okay what can we do to try and work through this and try and suggest that you come to a plan together um, don't take it personally and don't take it as a oh this is a a senior against a young female trainee or, or something don't take it personally just listen and think about maybe why they're why they're coming back with something that might be a little bit abrupt yeah i think i think that's really useful thanks i think that's really really good advice because it may be that people look at things from from different perspectives and different agendas and truly just don't understand um you know the complexities of the situation so that's, that, that's good advice thanks we're going to go to esther and then we're going to go to lizzie esther so 10% of trainees are out of training at any time, whether that is maternity, uh, OOPs, fellowships, uh, OOPs, uh, ill health. So departments need to have a backfill plan. One in 10 of their trainees will not be present and will not be backfilled from HEE. So pregnancy is just one of a small thing and it's small part of that really and it's amazing how unprepared rotors and medical staffing are for that figure i think that's a really important fact to always remember definitely lizzie so i was just going to kind of um add to susan's response to sot's question and really talk about culture and how it's really important that we support each other and our colleagues if we see culture that is inappropriate when they're pregnant i have seen um a number of like really inappropriate comments be made um to people and there is this pressure on that pregnant person um about starting their maternity leave at a certain time or coming off the on-call rotor and we need to be calling that out because it is is something that needs to change in the culture in order to be able to make progress we still work in a specialty that a huge proportion of our medical school colleagues see as inaccessible to them because of wanting a family. Um, and so I, I think um, I sort of just wanted to add a comment rather than a question. And I don't know if um, Susan's got any thoughts about this, but how do we challenge that culture um, to make it better for the people coming up behind us? I mean, I actually was really lucky. I had a really positive experience when I was pregnant in when I was in my um, one of my last trusts, Eastbourne Hospital. They were really great. I was expecting all of the negativity, all of the comments that you normally get. And in fact, I got lots of support from all of my male consultants. I didn't have any female consultants. Um, the management were overwhelmingly supportive, wanted to do everything to help me. Um, and if anything, I saw a different side to my consultants that I would have done otherwise, because they told me all the stories about their wives being pregnant and how difficult that all was, and were really help, happy to help me in every way. And I think the critical thing about that hospital is it was pretty well set up, like Esther says, about trying to make sure that they had good rotor planning in place and they had a bit of ease in the system. And so there wasn't that, that overwhelming pressure all the time. And I was very lucky. But hopefully that could be more commonplace for people. Lizzie, should we go on to you? 
Thank you. Okay, so um, my talk today is talking about how to manage with a child who has additional needs. Uh, so I'm Lizzie Chandra and I have just started my ST5 up in Yorkshire and the Humber. And having agreed to do this talk some time ago, when I actually sat down to think about it, I realised that it's really hard for me to work out how I managed with a child with additional needs. Because to me, that's all I've ever known. Um, and that's just parenting. My son's health problems started just a few weeks into his life. And since then, we've had peaks and troughs of problems, but it's always been there and it's always been something that we've had to deal with. A bundle of daily stuff, which is added to our usual days. Unfortunately, many children with chronic health problems and painful conditions also struggle from an emotional and development point of view. So in my world, I have both of these things to deal with. The early years of constant discomfort and disturbed sleep with these children are thought to result in really sort of volatile, anxious children. And I've definitely seen that firsthand. And you can get a lot of high risk taking behaviours, which most parents will know is a joy to manage in any child. <laughs> um, so my validation for talking about this is my son, who has this background of health problems with consequential emotional and behavioural needs. Um, but additional needs covers much more than that and it may cover those children with educational needs uh, and it may be something long term like I'm dealing with or it may be something a bit more short lived such as if you're going through a period of bereavement or family change. And I think most of us will have times in our life where we come to a point where somebody in our family, one of our offspring in particular, has additional needs. But for those who are living with it day in, day out for the long term, it is something that is a really big thing that they have to factor in to their career progression and their training. I understand that life is unpredictable and messy for all of us, but it is, um, it is very challenging when you're dealing with this on a daily basis. So when I've done this talk, what I've tried to do is think about who might be tuning in to listen. And so I've kind of tried to think about those who are setting out on a journey of new additional needs, which uh, may seem like a quite daunting process right now. For those in who are interested in understanding their colleagues who have children with additional needs or their friends' positions a little better, and for those in the throes of life with a child with additional needs, to say that you're not alone and maybe my experiences have something to offer, but I'd encourage people during this talk, uh, talk to use the chat box because having a child with additional needs is not a one size fit all, it's very personal and everybody will have different experiences and different life hacks as to how they manage and cope with it. What I say is neither gospel nor fact, it's just my truth and I hope that it can be of help to some of you. But to make this as helpful as possible, I've also spoken to several of my colleagues um, who have uh, children with additional needs of all sorts of different types and so hopefully some of that will be brought in and be helpful to you. So now I've given a bit of background, um, I thought I'd start with the practical stuff because the practical stuff is easy. And so I'm talking about things like the daily regime, hospital appointments, school meetings, the sleep deprivation, working when they're poorly, siblings and spouses and friends and family is roughly how I've split it up. So in terms of the daily regime, most children with additional uh, needs require additional care from a practical point of view. And I say this as a parent of two children, one of which does not have any additional needs. Getting to work with a smile on your face can be really hard when you've already done an hour of therapy for a child who doesn't really want it. All sorts of things take on a new dimension when you have a child with additional needs. Simple things like the meals and the cleaning and just logistics, ordering prescriptions and collecting them because most pharmacies don't open late at night, although that is getting better now. It all is just an extra challenge to family life. 
And the key for me to managing this has been uh, laminated wall charts and dry wipe pens, shared Google calendars with the people who support me in this journey, um, and an app called Cozy, C-O-Z-I, um, where you can share all the sorts of things that need to be done and sorted out in your life. You'll need to find your own way to manage the requirements of your child, but if you don't get it right, the emotional toil will knock you down, and I have been there at different times. There will always be new challenges that come up, and you'll have to find new ways of dealing with them, and sometimes that takes a little bit of sorting out and a little bit of trial and error. Be kind to yourself during those periods. It is difficult, and it's, uh, it's just something you have to get through. If you're unsure, seek support from those around you because others might have experiences that can help you with that. Those tactics of dry wipe uh, charts on the wall and calendars are also quite helpful with my next two um, topics that I wanted to talk about. Firstly, hospital appointments closely followed by school appointments. So hospital appointments usually come through really helpfully with one to two weeks ahead of the time that they are due. This, as you may know, is not enough time to take leave or cancel a clinic or anything useful to allow you or facilitate you to attend. Getting to a hospital appointment requires half a day. You have to leave work. You have to collect your child from school. You have to go back sometimes to the hospital where you were working an hour before to the hospital appointment. You then wait in a waiting room full of many, many children that is so loud that it's overwhelming even for a fully grown adult. Um, and then you have your appointment and then you need to get your child back to school, settle them in, often after they're a little bit distressed because somebody's stuck needles in them or done something generally unpleasant, um, and then get back to work. There is just no way it can be done in less than half a day. Cancelling appointments more than once is often not allowed. And if you do it too much, they send you a really pleasant letter that says, we're going to refer you to social services. That's a joy to receive. So. Um, just be aware if you have colleagues that have children who require hospital appointments, it riddles them with guilt, both for their child and their workplace, that it's so difficult to manage. And I would also give a plea to those involved in systems design and thinking about how we design the services that we offer to our patients, because at the moment it is, I would consider, not fit for purpose for working parents. School appointments and communication with school is another really challenging thing. Usually these appointments can only be held pretty much between the hours of eight and four. School can be really varying and I have experience of a couple of different school environments because we had to change because our first one um, didn't see our child's additional needs. That in itself is a really challenging process to go through and really emotional. You never know if you're dropping uh, from the frying, frying pan into the fire. And it takes a huge amount of emotional energy to make those decisions about your child. When you do get the right school, it's great, but they really want to support you and be involved, which requires lots of meetings and communication. The one thing I'm thankful for in this era of COVID is that I can now have these meetings from an office at work via Teams. And that is really helpful. And if your school, if you're involved in trying to communicate things with school are not there, and I think that would be hard to believe in this era, um, then it's definitely something to pursue because it has made life so much easier being able to have the, that communication virtually with school. Good communication with school is, is really vital and will really help you if you have a child with additional needs on your journey. If you are in a situation where you're butting up against people that aren't willing or wanting to help you and aren't finding solutions to the problems that you have, that's when I might say that it would be con worth considering whether you're at the right setting. Like I already said, there's a massive emotional toil to changing your setting, um, but it can really be worth it. And I just wanted to put that into the end of my bit about schools because I really agonized over it and then it was the best thing that we ever did. Um, my next section I was gonna talk, talk about was sleep deprivation. Every parent enters the new world of sleep deprivation. It's uh, the same for everyone and I don't deny that. 
but I do think it takes on a new dimension when you have a child with additional needs. It lasts much longer. For me, my eldest did not sleep through and until he was at least five years old and still has periods when his health is bad where he can't sleep well and I have to support him during the night. Doing that and then getting up and going into work the next day can be really hard. And it's also really frequent. So you have to kind of find a way to manage because you can't be going in every day or it feels like you can't be going in every day and saying that you're so tired. Um, my point about this is as a trainee, I think it's hugely anxiety provoking when you are suddenly in this situation that you didn't expect yourself to be in and you're worried that people think you're not going to cope, that you're not cut out for it and that you're going to have to think of a, an alternative career and I spent the first five or six years of my eldest's life worrying that that's what was going to be said to me. I had huge concerns that people would say that what I was dealing with was too much alongside a surgical career. If you're having those thoughts and you're living this life at the moment and you don't quite know what to do with them, my strong recommendation for that would be to look at finding a mentor, either locally or nationally, and if you can access it, access some coaching. It's really, really helpful to think through and talk through those really difficult emotions because when you're dealing with a child with additional needs and trying to be a surgical trainee, you don't need the added turmoil of um, the anxiety of wondering whether actually somebody's going to tell you to uh, find alternative um, employment. Um, the sleep deprivation thing goes hand in hand with the next bit on my list, which is uh, working when they're poorly, which again, I, I, it's, it's just trying to bring through to everybody the emotional load of having a child with additional needs. Packing your bag and walking out the door on a day when they're poorly is really, really difficult. And inevitably you will do it more than your colleagues do it because you have a child with additional need. Colleagues who don't have children with additional needs and are here to find out more about what it's like just remember that there is a huge amount of um, commitment from your colleagues who have children with additional needs going to work on days when they're poorly. I think from uh, the outside, it can seem like somebody might need more time off than other people, or um, there may be comments about not being as committed. And actually, these people are really, really trying incredibly hard and are dealing with a huge, um, amount of challenging things on a daily basis um, that makes it hard for them to go to work and yet they're still there. So actually they have a huge commitment to what they're doing. So please just be mindful of that. Siblings and spouses is the next thing. So if, uh, this is just sort of general parenting thing, uh, stuff that came from some sessions that we did um, with the hospital. Uh, Cause I went on, as I said, to have a second child who doesn't have additional needs. And um, it can be really difficult balancing the needs of both of them because the, um, the, the additional needs obviously grab your attention much more frequently. Um, and the children as in any relationship can, um, uh, be um, the centre of everything that you're doing and make things a bit trickier at home. So just be aware of that. And again, don't be scared to seek help if you need to. Friends and family is a really important part. It's really difficult because you will find that a lot of friends and family are less keen to have play dates, support you with looking after your child or be able to manage their additional needs. People tend to fall into two camps, the ones that don't want to because it slightly scares them and the ones that really want to but aren't necessarily cut out for it, which can be a really, really tricky thing to manage with your friends and family. Um, I would recommend uh, getting yourself a really uh, probably small but strong support group for this because otherwise it's going to be um, quite tricky. I've talked a lot through all of that about the um, emotional side of it and it was one of the things that I really wanted to bring out in this talk because the burden that comes with having uh, living in a family with a child with additional needs is really big and it just brings a whole new dimension to everything in your life. Um, and it shouldn't be underestimated. I think that's my main message really is that if you have a child with ad additional needs, you need to be looking after yourself a huge amount 
And as a parent, it's really difficult to uh, remember that you need to put yourself first sometimes, but it's really essential because you're not going to get through surgical training and family life with a child with additional needs without doing that. And that's really what I wanted to end on is a little bit of um, be kind to yourself and look after yourself and um, yeah, make sure you do some self TLC because it's really important. And I'd be really happy to um, answer any questions. And if anybody's got any thing that they would like to ask me privately at another time, then do feel free to get in touch. Lizzie, thank you so much for all of that. I feel like you are an exceptionally wise person and I really love the way that you've just explained all of that to someone like me who has no clue what that must be like. So thank you so much for that. Um, I was going to ask Esther, as head of School of Surgery, from your point of view, what your experience is of sort of the deanery end of, of looking after trainees who have um, children with additional needs um, and what that's like. Well, thankfully, it's not that common, but... we can't help if we very nicely is explained to us what her issues are. Now, if we don't know, and that could be your educational supervisor, your TPD, your head of school, your professional support unit, uh, your support champion, college tutors, if we don't know, we can't help. Uh, and there are lots of ways that we can make life easier some of which I'm going to talk about a bit later on always come first and your workplace should support that and most trusts 80 percent of their workforce is female and your employer is often a lot more savvy and able to support you than your doctor colleagues who don't have that 80 percent female uh, ratio thank you I'm going to cut the questions short there, but when we air this, if there are other questions on the chat, please do put them through and we will we will respond to them. And we're going to move on now to Esther McClarty's talk. Thank you so much, Lizzie. We're moving on to Esther McClarty's talk as head of School of Surgery for the South West Deanery. Thank you, Katie. I'm really pleased to be asked to talk here. This is uh, something that is really close to my heart uh, from personal experience. Um, both having had several failed pregnancies and then a successful pregnancy as a consultant. So I haven't actually experienced uh, training and pregnancy, but I've certainly experienced working with pregnancy. So there are several things that you can do to maximize your training during pregnancy. The first is consider a suitable post for your pregnancy. Now, Open pelvic oncology is not a good thing to do. As I discovered, you can't actually get close enough to the table to reach a prostate by the time you're about six months out. And laparoscopic surgery, if you're operating on a nice slim person so that you have plenty of instrument outside of them, yes, you can get to the table. But the minute you operate on somebody who's obese and the instruments have disappeared inside, once again, it's so uncomfortable unless you have extremely long arms, it just doesn't work. And so you need to consider your post, somewhere where you can sit down, somewhere where you've got good radiation protection, somewhere where you can consider adjustment to rotors and potentially beginning a bigger unit where the impact of one person not being on call is much less may well help. Your trust is a predominantly female employer. They have excellent policies generally on maternity leave, risk assessment, occupational health departments will be very used to dealing with pregnancy in a healthcare environment. But also talk to your TPD, college tutor, support champion, uh, whoever you feel comfortable with about your condition and your training. When you return to work, after hopefully a lovely period of maternity leave, where if you're lucky, you've got a sleeping baby, you should be fully integrated into the support programme. And I know that's going to be talked about later. 
Ideally, you'd return to the same department you left where your competencies and confidence beforehand were remembered. You accrue annual leave during maternity leave and some people add it to the end of their maternity leave, but I would challenge you that perhaps you're gonna find going back to work more challenging than you expected from late nights, feeding, and you may wish to spread it out on individual days over the first few weeks. Less than full-time training I'll discuss in a minute. And confidence and competence are not the same thing when you get back. I'd been a consultant for five years when I came back to work. Well, when I went off pregnant, in fact. When I came back, although I was probably at the top of my game, my confidence certainly wasn't there. And perhaps the only person who really didn't think I was up to it was me. Breastfeeding and pumping. Well, every large employer has to have a safe space for feeding and pumping, and it needs to be planned into your day. And if you are up all night, actually, is coming to work the best thing the next morning? Most of your colleagues, particularly your older ones, will have been through the young child years. And occasionally they will cut you a bit of slack, but only if you communicate and ask for it. So less than full time training, there have been two tiers for a long time. Uh, full information about this should be on your January websites. Any trainee is uh, eligible to apply for less than full-time training, but they are supposed to show or have made, been needing to show that this training on a full-time basis wouldn't be practical for them. And that is childcare, medical procedures, including fertility treatment. Uh, and I think that is one of the last taboos in medicine uh, professionally is that we're not allowed to talk about fertility and our fertility and how it affects us as we go through our careers. Caring responsibilities or ill disabled partner or relatives, all good reasons to less than full time. And there's a second tier of unique opportunities for the Olympic sports people, for those with re religious commitments or training and non-medical development. But there is now going to be category three, which I think is really important. And it may help those both considering pregnancy, whether it's to get their lifestyle and well-being in order, whether it's to help partners uh, in addition. But this is open to all and it's after a successful trial in A&E. And it's going to be phased into the next two years to all specialties where those who want to work at 80% can and it will be limited on the dependent on the number of trees on other oops and less than full time, um, but it will be available for anybody to apply to. So when you go less than full time, there are several options of how you might be placed. Uh, the most common and the a good way both for trainees and for the service is to have two trainees on a slot share and ideally this is at 60% each. The deanery will pay 1.2 uh, whole time equivalents instead of one. And it enables two trainees to work often overlapping for one day a week. Uh, it can provide some flexibility so that if they do have an ill child or extra caring responsibilities, some can do more one week, some can do more the next. It allows some time between you if you're flexible for, to go to those hospital appointments if required. You can also work full time in a, sorry, part time in a whole time slot up to 0.9 uh, and occasionally supernumerary, although this is the last option. Uh, you have to be sure, uh, we as trainers have to be sure that you don't compromise the training of other individuals. And there's a new OOP. <laughs> Um, it was known as the OOP pause and it's been trialled for a year where people could just come out of training for a period of time. It's now called the OOP P COVID-19 and it's part of HE's response to the current COVID emergency uh, and it's going to be expended to all specialties and in fact the application window opened August 2020. It allows trainees to pause their training to attend, undertake non-NHS uh, training posts. So that could be for a urologist, a period in A&E or ITU, or it could in fact just be a post in a urology department they know, that means they can live close to home, that means that they can go to work part-time, that they can be supported. 
COVID-19 has brought extra stresses around availability of childcare, availability of using grandparents as emergency childcare, particularly if they're shielding and you're working in a hospital with a high prevalence of COVID. It should allow trains to, needs to get further experience, take talk, stock of their training, but most importantly, it's there to concentrate on trainee well-being. Any competencies that you gain while you're out of training can be assessed on return. And this can lead to some of that training time being counted for your next ARCP. Now, HE hopes to achieve well-being amongst trainees. Uh, to improve morale, improve well-being and improve programme management. To be eligible for an OP, you have to have completed your first year of specialty training with an outcome 1, 10.1 or 10.2. Uh, it just has to be beneficial for your well-being um, or to gain additional competencies. And applications for an OOP are going to be assessed on a first come, first serve basis. And you need to actually identify your OOP at the time of application. And again, the uh, application forms and more information are on your deanery websites and on the HEE websites. The process of returning to training after an OOP, well, it's very much along the support program uh, lines. Uh, you have an initial educational appraising meeting with your educational supervisor and to consider any competencies gained and a gap analysis. Uh, it forms the basis of a training plan and any skills gained are assessed at your next ARCP. And there's no requirement to adjust the CCT date. That period out of training would just mean your CCT is extended by one year. But if you have gained additional competencies, it can be shortened, but you can also use it as just a period of time to gain more experience with not, without ticking away on your training clock. I mean, parenthood is, is marvelous, it's wonderful. Your career will never ever come first again, um, but, training exams, GMC requirements and CCT are all on change. So at some point in your career as a parent, you're also going to have to make time to complete those things. I would say about pregnancy and parenthood, plan it if you can. And clearly we can't all plan when we get pregnant. Talk to your TP and your mentor. Try and perhaps have placements further away from home prior to children. Uh, although you do need to kind of meet your partner potentially from time to time to uh, conceive. Uh, remember equality of access for those who don't have children. Some of the loudest complaints I hear are from those who have no ch children who feel they are pushed about to uh, fill the spaces for parents. I'd advise you not to do your exams with very small children if at all possible. You just don't have the brain capacity because of the sleep and to use your support champions. That's what they're there for. And I've got some golden rules. You need to have bulletproof child management to manage a surgical, sorry, time management and child management to uh, manage a surgical career and children or even just one child. You need to have a bomb-proof partner who's supportive or a co-parent or grandparents. And you need to have nuclear blast-proof childcare 24-7 in an emergency. Uh, we, we've all had to use it at some point or another. And my last experience of this week is please don't pick up your children from forest school in a dry clean only suit because this is what they look like. So thank you. Thanks, Esther. That's really great. Um, I sort of, I know we are pushed for time on questions, but one of the questions I get asked a lot and I discuss a lot with a lot of people is this exact point you were talking about, about planning pregnancy, about when is the right time to have a child? And I was just interested in your viewpoint on that. So there's only a right time for you and when you're lucky enough to become pregnant, your training can work around it. I would say the very difficult times are when you're on the very steep learning curves. So that is in the perhaps ST3 year when you're desperately trying to gain some surgical confidence and competence and peri exam. Pregnancy and young children peri exam are really challenging. Exams are challenging enough. Okay. 
are there any questions anyone else has for Esther? Yeah, Sot. Thanks, Esther. That was a that was a really really uh, really useful talk, and it's good to know to hear about what HAE are doing for um, the out of program activities. Now, just a quick question from my perspective. So, I did a nephrectomy today, and I hadn't done one for two weeks because I've been off. And I thought to myself, God, I feel a bit rusty here. Um, and as you first mentioned, you know, when you had one of your children, you know, you were five years into a consultant, you're at the top of your game, but you felt really low in confidence. Is there anything you can do to try and improve your confidence when you're coming back? Or is it just one of these things? Um, I've always thought that would be one of the most difficult aspects of coming back to work, I, I've always imagined. So for me, it was quite difficult because actually you're walk through the door and you are the consultant again. And actually there is no place uh, and no provision for mentoring consultants coming back from maternity leave. Uh, I, however, had dinner with a lawyer about two weeks before I came back and he said to me, Esther, just make sure there's somebody else available if you have any trouble in your first few weeks. Uh, he's a medico legal lawyer. Um, so it did actually chivy me along to make sure that I did have somebody around or in the building. And the first, I think, cystectomy I did, I did with another colleague. Um, as a trainee, you should ensure that your trainer is there and present and around, because if they're not, firstly, that isn't training. And secondarily, you do need that uh, confidence building. Um, and as I say, confidence and competence are not the same. It's unlikely you will have lost your competence. You just meet a tiny little bit rusty with your hands, as we all are. I actually found the operating side of things for things like endourology, I didn't find as I didn't really find it as difficult getting back to operating. It was stuff like suddenly you're on the ward and everybody's like, what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like having to process all of those thoughts all at once I found that was a much more challenging thing and I felt much more on the spot in those situations leaving ward rounds when I came back to work just to begin with were much harder than just being able to be almost anonymous in the operating theatre and and kind of go at whatever pace I wanted to um so it's, it's I think everybody focuses on the operative side of things but it's the whole package of coming back to work is actually difficult and challenging sometimes yeah I think one of the things about being slightly more senior is perhaps that yeah. that's the ward management is perhaps automatic pilot and if you're lucky you've got some fantastic registrars who are ahead of you anyway um, so uh, everybody has their own challenges I just think we have to be very aware that everybody is challenged by coming back to work I have one question about the the oop pause that you mentioned about that being used is that specifically just for the time of covid or is there a kind of a plan for that to always be present or is it just until whenever future time point happens when covid is no longer as much of a problem as it is now so it was trial before covid and it's been slightly adjusted and widened because of covid uh, it's something that I would anticipate continuing in the longer term. Uh, however, we will have to have some kind of sensible limit about how many people can be out of programme at any one time, uh, just purely because we need to know how many SD3 numbers we can put in the bottom, you know, otherwise we start to deny other people training. Um, but yes, it's, it, we're, we're hoping it's going to stay long term and it certainly seems to be the plan. Any other questions? I was just thinking, maybe slightly DNA, maybe not, but any advice for trainees that have done the right thing and put off children and done their exams, but then they're actually getting really close to finishing training and are probably a bit anxious about getting pregnant maybe six months before the end of training. They're trying to think of fellowships. It's actually a really, even if you think you've done the right thing, it's a really busy time. And what if you don't get pregnant when you've planned and all of a sudden your training's finished and you haven't sorted a fellowship because you didn't want to do, know what to do. Obviously asking for a friend. <laughs> so <laughs> there is uh, one problem here, which is when you come off the end of your training and work as a consultant, and I have to say I'm slightly off on the detail, you lose your right to maternity leave potentially oh, for a period of time. <laughs> 
So, you know, if you've been off for between, from one employer to another, uh, you, yeah. a training program counts as one employer. So you have to be very careful about that. Okay. Um, you know, <sighs> you it's need to be careful time, it? <laughs> it's an awkward time but you know your fertility drops off a cliff after the age of 40 and we're not having a fertility talk uh but one of the very uh, useful things to do is to assess your own fertility and that can be done with a blood test these days so you know there are actually bigger pictures than the career about getting older and having kids Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, you're not as old as me. <laughs> and I don't mean you're as old as I was when I got pregnant. <laughs> so how's that get on with it? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm sure there'll be lots of other questions on the chat. And as I mentioned previously, we will get to those um, in the live um, session. Hi, we're just rejoining the video record. We've got Kerry Chadwick, who is the Health Education England Supported Return to Training Fellow. She's just joined us. Before we start with Kerry, we just wanted to go back to that last point that we had about access to your maternity rights uh, when you're transferring from your um, final year of training in, into a fellowship position. The issue really is because you're going into a fellowship training position, which can be considered to be a break in your NHS service. And that's where you may come into difficulties with getting in your NH with um, getting your maternity rights let's move on to Kerry Kerry welcome thank you for joining us thank you and um, so I'm Kerry Chadwick I'm um, a national clinical fellow for supported return to training for the previous year so um, 2019 to 20 um, and I'm also a paediatric registrar in the West Midlands I'm just going to share my presentation Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, confidence in returning to work and the supported return to training or support program. So um, about two years ago, um, Health Education England um, set up um, the supported return to training program as part of their um, work towards enhancing junior doctors working lives. So at any one time, there's around 50,000 trainees within England, um, so that's obviously wider for the whole of the UK, and 10% of those, or about 5,000, um, are taking time out of training at any one time. So a lot of the discussions about the difficulties returning to work um, came from the discussions around the ACAS junior doctor's contract in 2016, and obviously um, lots of the um, media coverage about Hadiza Balagaba and the situation that she found herself in and um, brought those um, problems to the forefront. So the contract agreement has aimed to remove as far as possible the disadvantage of those who take time out, um, whatever the reason for that. Um, and they've also aimed to include targeted accelerated learning, mentorship and study leave funding as well. So there are lots of reasons why people take time out. Um, and you can see here that there are a big proportion, about 38% that take time out for maternity leave. There's a large number um, and it's increasing all the time of those who are taking time um, out of programme for things like um, experience, research, training opportunities, but also for career breaks um, and the new OOP or pauses. So there are a lot of reasons that people um, take time out of the normal training pathway, but also to gain experience within their training program. There's also a proportion of those um, that have um, time out kind of forced upon them. Um, so those who um, are out of training for a period of time due to health reasons, and also um, those who um, are in the smaller minority, but still, um, a good number who have either had um, DMC restrictions put on, they've had suspensions to their license. Um, and there's a group that have also um, kind of deferred entry into specialty training or the next stage of specialty training, or were previously kind of SAS or trust grade doctors that are coming into a training program. So what does support offer? Um, well, its main aims are to be an individualized training package um, where you can choose from a menu of options. It helps to 
provide a structured and systematic process um, that all kind of supervisors and trainees can follow. And it works um, as a kind of hub and spoke model, so a national overview with some regional delivery. Any trainee within England um, who has either um, accepted a training post to start or has um, currently been on a training programme and then has a um, time out of programme for three months or more um, is eligible for support. Um, that's widened actually over the last few months and during COVID um, to include those who have either been shielding or have had their job role significantly changed because they're high risk and also those who've been significantly redeployed. So you may find particularly within your um, specialty um, being quite a craft specialty um, with lots of procedures. If people have been moved out of that um, kind of normal uh, surgical environment to work in a medical um, area, for example, or if they've been shielding and haven't been able to um, practice those clinical skills, um, then that can be really relevant. Um, and I would suggest that you have a look into what the support programme can offer. So there's a big variety. And as I say, each region offers slightly different things um, and each specialty as well. Um, a lot of the Royal Colleges um, have put together different courses, et cetera, that would be relevant. So most places offer um, some kind of return a workshop. And these are really good because they allow you to kind of meet other people that have been out of training for whatever reason. Um, particularly, um, I think for maternity leave, people find that really useful because they can share their experiences, they can share their worries about um, going back to work. Um, there are a lot of um, simulation courses and clinical refresher courses. Um, many of these are run by um, the specialty themselves or by the support programme. But if there is something that's really relevant, so particularly, you know, if it's a smaller surgical specialty um, or one that has a specific skill and a course that's offered, then please do speak to the support office and see if you can have some funding towards that. Because if it's something that's really important to make you safe to return, then um, most regions will be willing to at least discuss that as an option. There are a lot of options that focus on non-clinical skills as well. Um, so things like human factors, assertiveness, um, self-awareness, personal management, all of those things. Um, and I think these can be really useful and they're often kind of overlooked, um, particularly by those who are, um, you know, high flying, have been out for research, etc., cetera, um, or are in one of those, um, you know, really competitive surgical areas, et cetera. Um, they can maybe not see this as their main focus before they return, but I think some of these skills are actually really, really useful. There are a number of um, networking events and conferences that run differently in different regions. Um, so just have a look and see what's around. It's really good just to get an understanding of what's available and um, how the programme works in your area. Lots of places offer some form of coaching as well, which is good to access, um, particularly if you're planning quite a complicated return or it's a transition point, et cetera, where you're thinking about actually coming close to the end of your training or moving to the next kind of step um, within your specialty. And there's often mentoring programs within the region as well, where they compare you with someone who's kind of been through a similar return experience, um, just so that you can kind of get some advice from them and, and have a bit of a chat about the circumstances that you find yourself in. The way that the program works is that none of this is mandatory. Um, so you can engage with any parts that you um, feel are relevant to you. And I think that's really important. So actually, if you feel like a course on its own um, is something that's gonna help you be safe and that's all you want to do, then that's absolutely fine. Um, but there's a structure that's kind of suggested and I think it's quite a good approach just to get you thinking about the different stages that the program can be helpful. So um, the first would be a pre-absence meeting, which we suggest about three months before um, you go on leave or at any time if it's unplanned. And that helps you lay out what kind of things you're going to do while you're um, out of training to keep up to date. 
um, what kind of things you might need to think about in advance. So if you're going to consider returning less than full time, if there are um, certain events that you would like to use either kit split or supported return to training days for, then you can look at those dates in advance and book them in. And you can try and have a discussion with your supervisors or the support team about what resources are available in your re region and they can signpost you to those. Then also suggested that you have an initial return meeting, so about two to three months before you come back. And that's really just to have a conversation about what is relevant to your particular specialty and particular placement. So it's really good to let um, the wider team know, so your HR team, medical staffing, um, consultants that are going to be on call, for example, when you return, so that they're a little bit aware of um, what kind of changes or supernumerary periods that um, you might be accessing and that might be useful. And it helps you just discuss any of the concerns that you've got um, that might impact on your return and kind of find targeted ways to um, help address those um, in a good period of time before you go back. It's also suggested that we um, have a return review meeting and I think this is quite important. There's so much anxiety often about going into um, training again or going into the clinical placement, particularly if you've been out of training for a long period of time. So it's really good to kind of discuss what's happened, um, discuss any continuing concerns that you have, any kind of targets that you've had before you went back, have they been met? Is there anything that you found really difficult or not been able to achieve? And how important is that to you being safe or feeling confident to return to a full rotor? Um, and I think that's just an important question to discuss with your supervisors. Are you ready to resume your normal duties or is there something different that you need to think about or a different area that you might need to gain a bit more experience in? Um, so for example, there is often funding for a supernumerary or an enhanced supervision period. It's different in different regions and it ranges from a couple of days to actually a couple of weeks. Um, but if this is available, I would say really try and utilise that and use it to your advantage in terms of gaining the experience in areas that you are going to find difficult. So um, don't just accept that it's a supernumerary period and you're going to work where they need service provision. Actually, if you're really uncomfortable in an acute A&E situation or if you haven't done outpatient clinics for a long period of time and that's what you're most nervous about, or if it's a certain procedure um, that you want to do a list of, try and target it towards what your needs are to try and gain the most confidence. There's a few educational um, resources that are available. So if you go on the um, HEE website, there's a digital resources link um, and we'll post this in the uh, accompanying kind of information. But you'll find that there is a link to the regional support um, websites that has often a list of events and courses in your area. There is um, some links to an e-learning for health module for both trainers and then trainees, which is coming. There's some clinical refresher courses, um, particularly for your junior trainees who um, want some refreshers on things like ECGs, acute kidney injury, etc. cetera. Um, they're all there and quite useful. And there's some more generic resources on um, well-being, as I've mentioned, human factors, etc. So actually, if you just want to listen to um, a podcast and get a bit of a flavour for what's discussed, then that's quite useful. I did also just want to mention, um, I know I've kind of touched upon the fact that it's been expanded to shielding trainees during COVID-19, but there's also a section that's full of guidance, that's full of trainers, checklists and specific um, webinars for shielding trainees. So if that's relevant to any of you um, or any of your colleagues, please do point them in that direction and definitely get them to contact their support um, office as well. This is just a little quote from um, a clinical research fellow who returned after three years. Um, and they have said that actually their confidence working in the clinical environment was reduced. Um, they were really concerned about the how a lack of confidence would affect their decision making. Um, and they were worried that they would be quite indecisive and struggle to get things done, particularly if it was an on-call shift 
um, that was busy. And that's a theme that runs throughout returning trainees. So my first tip is really that you're not alone. This is a big group of people that take time out of training for any reason. It's really normal um, and feeling underconfident or feeling like you need to refresh certain areas is a completely natural thing that we hear all of the time. Take some time, I think, to acknowledge what your time out has done for you and whether this is something that you've chosen or something that's kind of been forced upon you. I think there are always um, skills that you've gained during that time, whether actually it's for health reasons and you have a, a better understanding of where your patients are coming from or how things can affect your colleagues and um, patients, or whether this is, you know, time for research, et cetera, that really, although it's extended your training, has really added value to you as a person and your understanding of certain things. I think there is sometimes a negative feeling towards time out of training and that really shouldn't be the case. I think we really need a breadth of doctors and a breadth of experience and um, rushing through a training program is not always the best way for each person. Um, take your time, don't expect yourself to go back at the same kind of stage or in the same kind of speed etc that you were when you left because it's perfectly normal to just take a little bit more time to get through things ask questions of people around you. Don't be afraid to mention that you've had time out. Um, obviously, don't answer questions you don't, you don't want to um, and escalate concerns if you feel like you need to. And what I would say is maybe give yourself some hard lines of things that you really don't feel comfortable to do and ways that you're going to escalate if you feel uncomfortable or like you're not um, clinically prepared or safe. Um, share your experiences. It's really valuable to talk them through with friends um, or people that have been through the same thing. Let your supervisors and the support office know as early as possible so that you can actually access all of those opportunities that are available to you. Use the resources and definitely try and use your keeping in touch um, shared parental leave days or your supported return to training days. I think they're underused and are very valuable. Um, and as I've mentioned before, take some supernumerary time or enhanced supervision time and get yourself um, back to where you feel confident as much as possible. There are some resources there, but I will um, put those into the information that accompanies this session as well. Thank you very much. Kerry, thank you. That was really great. Um... Are there any questions from the floor? Lizzie. I was just wondering, Kerry, if you have any advice for us, probably particularly in a surgical specialty. So I have recently returned to program from an out of program experience and the out of program experience I was on, uh, not similar to your, dissimilar to your own, um, was lots of different specialties. And uh, the experience of some of my colleagues in other specialties has been vastly different to mine. And I think there is a bit of a culture in surgery of just kind of get on and cope. Um, and many of us can and it's fine, but some of us can't. And some of us have problems with some bits, but not other bits. How do you kind of embed this as a culture in a specialty that might be maybe a little bit resistant to it? It's really difficult. Um, and it's something that comes up a lot. And I think, um, in some ways, um, there are certain specialties where that feels a little bit easier than, than others. Um, but I have come across certain comments um, and people that have had bad return experiences in almost any specialty. Um, we've done a lot of work around um, culture in general, but particularly in um, some of the surgical specialties. And I think Hopefully things are getting better over time. I think as flexibility in training and different training pathways are becoming more common, it's kind of being um, forced to be a little bit more acceptable. And I think it's really helpful that now we've got, um, at least in England, this kind of structured approach and way forward, because it kind of gives people a bit of a linchpin to kind of start those conversations with supervisors. It still doesn't make it easy. Um, and we understand that. And we understand that actually there are lots of times where you come across resistance or people don't maybe see the value in 
in what you're trying to do. Um, but I think there is there is a certain part in knowing that you are not the only person and actually whatever the circumstances are, just try and find the value in what you're doing um, and try and hold on to um, the different kind of things that you can that you can bring when you return. Um, it's difficult and it's difficult when there's a when there's lots of emotions or different kind of personal circumstances you know if you're trying to balance coming back with um, child care or you know caring responsibilities that's very very difficult um, and it is all just about a bit of balance and it's difficult sometimes to face those comments when you're already feeling a little underconfident or a little less sure of your abilities um, and for any supervisors or colleagues that are watching that aren't taking time out, I think just try and bear in mind that it's really difficult for people um, and try and be as accepting as you can. The only way a culture is gonna change is if we all change it. Um, so hopefully by the time we're all in the most senior positions, um, it will be a bit of a different environment. That's all I can say really, I think. I think that's a great point. Um, the only other thing I'd like to just add in specific to urology based on the things you were talking about earlier about simulation and courses and um, almost some of the um, non-technical skills. And um, so I know that there's the urology boot camp. It's sort of mainly based towards an ST3 level, but I know that they have been looking at doing it at, at higher levels as well. And that's a really good option for anybody that is thinking about wanting to just refresh their skills just to prior to going back to training. Obviously, the dates can be a bit difficult to work out, but it's not a bad option. There's also the BAUS mentorship program where you can seek mentorship from people for specific, specific things. So it's always worthwhile looking into that as well. Um, are there any other comments anyone else would like to make? Claire? I just wondered what you thought, I know we touched briefly about supporting each other and supporting people coming back to work, but often you can come across condescending or you're trying to be supportive and it doesn't always really work out. What can we do as, as a group of trainees if we've got somebody coming back from, I mean, we all know who's coming back from maternity and things like that. Is there anything that you think that we could do to try and make that environment better for them returning? Or is it just such a personal thing that you can't? I think it's really difficult um, because one of the one of the things that is really helpful is actually to have a bit of an open environment where you feel like you can talk to your colleagues about being a little bit rusty or you can say, actually, I haven't done this for a long time. And that's kind of the beauty of the supernumerary period is if there's other people around, then you can kind of go to them for support. But at the same time, particularly for those who have um, been on an unplanned um, kind of period of time out, so for health reasons, et cetera, there might well be um, questions that they don't want to answer or that they don't want being brought up in a large group of people. So, for example, people have said to me previously that, you know, they've come back and it's been mentioned in a handover room full of people. Oh, where have you been? Have you enjoyed your holiday? Those kind of things. And actually for people to then kind of squash those anxieties and try and come out with something that is useful and gets the team on board is really difficult. So I suppose um, don't be afraid to talk about it, but try not to try and let them lead the conversation. I think um, I think all of the things that we would find useful, just try and look at it from from um, their perspective. So actually, you know, um, particularly during COVID times, is there things that have changed that are just not natural to them? So I returned recently and actually, you know, everyone's very used to putting on PPE and um, they're used to um, just going about that day-to-day -day kind of change in a very relaxed way and to me going back into that environment that was really you know really new to me and my reaction to that was very different to everybody around me um, and I suppose that's quite similar to you know certain surgical things that have changed or you know if a procedure is done slightly differently in the place that you're going to if there's been a big kind of 
clinical change in guidance, particularly if it's been a long period of time. I think just giving people the space and the information to help them get used to it themselves and to build a bit of confidence. Um, yeah, you're not teaching them from scratch, but help point them towards the things that will help, I guess, would be my advice. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Kerry and all the other speakers from part one. I now welcome you to part two, where we have Pippa, Evo and Charlie to talk to us about their experiences of parental leave. And so I'll kick off with our first speaker, so Charlie, would you like to take us away? Sure, thank you Katie. Um, so I have been asked obviously to talk you through some tips, um, uh, practical tips on um, parental leave. I myself um, had two children and um, I did full-time training throughout um, that time. Uh, my first practical tips would be that you really need to talk to your trainers and your TPD um, as early on as possible. I think um, you need to sort of decide where you are at your training, uh, what you need to achieve still. Have you done your exam? Have you not done your exam? Um, and, and really go through um, those details as early as you feel comfortable to do. Um, think about your ARCP and abstention and all of those sorts of things. Do you still need to get through ST4 checklists or ST6 checklists? I'd advise that you filled out your paperwork um, ahead of time. Um, particularly, you need to remember you've got to fill out paperwork for the trust, for the deanery, for the JCST. Your CCT date needs to be recalculated and all those things. So the sooner you do that and, and get that headache out of the way, the better you will feel. Um, there's a lot that you need to think about in terms of pay um, because you will have rotated when you're in training. So the trust you're at may not be the trust that pays your um, all of your maternity pay or, or your paternity pay. Um, those things are split. So really understanding um, uh, the, the difference between ordinary maternity pay and statutory maternity pay and which trust is paying that is really um, key because it takes the headache out of it if you know exactly which trust you should be chasing when one of them goes wrong because they will go wrong when you're on, um, on mat leave and you've got a million other things going on in your brain. Um, so I, would, can, I can't stress enough making sure you've got the right email address and the right phone number for someone to, to ring because you don't want to be sitting on switchboard when you're still trying to, um, when you're up to your eyeballs in nappies. Um, fill out your paperwork, I would say as well, for return to work, if you possibly can. Um, because if you know this ahead of time and you know, uh, I think it really helps. I, I did that and um, I knew who my general manager was, who my supervisor was going to be, who my route coordinator was. And it took a lot of the stress out of going back to work. So those would be um, some of my practical tips and then things I would personally um, advise or, or, or um, suggest would be that you thought about coming back to work in line with when rotation changeovers happen. So, uh, you know, in October or April, I think you are more likely to get the job you want. And um, if you make it easier for your TPDs to be able to slot you into places. So, um, you know, it's tricky if you want the, one of the best regions in the job, uh, best job in the region, sorry, for your um, particular level of training, but you don't want to come back to January. That's really difficult for your TPD and for the trust to just leave that post vacant for three months. So kind of boxing clever a little bit about that. You're more likely to get what you want if you can slot um slot slot in a little more easily and i would really advise as personal tip that you went back to a department you've worked in before um, familiarity really helps um with all of that and to kind of takes the stress out when the, the other members of the team the consultants the nursing staff if they've known you before um that you'll find that you're a lot more supported when you return um and actually my i, I um, seem to be going on about fixing return it helps you then also map when you can start claiming annual leave before your return and that really helps your pay packet when you've been on statutory maternity pay for a couple of months which is you know 500 quid a month um, my only other two last tips would be um, 
uh, definitely don't work after 36 weeks of pregnancy. There is absolutely nothing to be gained from it. You should um, just be horizontal on your sofa with your feet up, trying to get the swelling down and enjoy the time on your, uh, you know, before everything goes crazy. And really enjoy your parental leave will be my last tip because you won't get it back and, you know, work will still be there when you get back to work. So, you know, enjoy it, enjoy the time off. Thank you. So my talk is um, on enhancing parental leave. I took various types of parental leave, including shared parental leave um, and uh, paternity leave, and mo more recently, parental leave. So we're going to talk about all of those and how I found was useful for enhancing it. So um, these are my boys. Um, they're two and a quarter and 11 weeks. Um, with the first boy, we had two weeks of paternity leave, then a four week block of shared parental leave. And then I came back to work uh, and I was planning to do that a few times during the period, but I ended up taking another seven months of shared parental in basically two blocks. So one of uh, one, which was the first one, which was a month and then another six months after that. And then with the second boy, I took the sort of maximum, which is two weeks with an unpaid parental leave of four weeks and then some annual leave at the end of that. Uh, and I currently work 10.2 PAs. Um, so my current roles are doing endurology, upper tract laparoscopic surgery, pediatric urological surgery, and then teaching and doing technology. Um, in terms of uh, paternity leave, these are the, the basic rules. Um, two weeks paid paternity leave um, is, well, you can take one or two weeks in one week blocks. Um, I don't know who would take one week. Uh, it seems like a crazy idea to take one week of paternity leave. Two weeks seems like a very, very short amount. Um, leave cannot start before the birth and, and has to end within 56 days of the birth. Um, and you must give your employer 28 days notice to change the start date. Obviously, it starts when the baby's born uh, or um, within those, 20, within those uh, 56 days. Um, if you can, you should try and plan it with your employer, especially if you know the date of your planning, something like a C-section. Uh, in terms of tips, um, as I said, you give the employer plenty of notice. So 15 weeks of, uh, before the baby is due, you have to tell the employer, but it's better to tell them way in advance of that. Um, and then you have to fill a form in to get paid paternity leave, basically so the trust can claim it back. Um, and if I were, yeah, I would just recommend taking as much leave as possible around that time. In terms of shared parental leave, you can share up to 50 weeks of leave and up to 36 weeks of uh, uh, parental leave between, of pay, paternity pay between you in the first year your child is born. And need both be employed for the first uh, 26 weeks continuously before the end of the 15th week before due date. Um, and then you have to book, you can book up to three separate blocks of shared parental leave each. Uh, and you need to give eight weeks notice at least for those. And then that you can take 20 shared parental leave, keep in touch days. In addition, you can also take those and have the maternity keep in touch days, which are 10 days. Uh, so you can have, to, if, uh, if you're a woman, I think you can have 30, whereas uh, you can have 20 if you're doing the shared parental leave. Uh, in terms of parental leave, parental leave is a relatively, uh, well, they're both relatively new concepts, but parental leave is unpaid. You take 18 weeks leave for each child up to their 18th birthday with a limit of four weeks per year for each child uh, and must take parental leave as whole weeks and 21 days notice is needed before the intended start date. Uh, so your employer can delay your parental leave if they say there's a disruption to the business. Uh, so that's one of the easiest ways to stop uh, people um, taking parental leave so because as surgeons we're often going to be um, a significant disruption to the business. Um, it's being, uh, it can't be stopped if it's take, being taken immediately after the birth or, or adoption of a child. So that is a useful time you can take the maximum leave. Um, and it means an employer would no longer qualify uh, for parental leave. So you can't, they can't just keep delaying it until the child's 18. Uh, but that seems unusual. Um, in terms of enhancing leave, um, these are the things I found, which was discussed leave early with the clinical director and service line manager. Um, keep records of all of these discussions because often it's months beforehand you're discussing it and then people have forgotten what they agreed to. 
um, in those meetings, try and agree on what you're going to do with the split days um, and agree on what, um, what you need to prioritize in terms of your clinical practice. Uh, so for most of us, I presume it's going to be operative days rather than um, anything, rather than clinics, because I feel like you lose a lot of your operative skill when you're off. Um, and then in terms of um, payment, you should agree on what you're paid during the split days. Um, in the end, we agreed that we should be paid on waiting list initiatives in my trust, uh, because basically I was providing lists when I went came back for split days. Uh, the trust um, then later decided that I need to be paid on a on a on a different measure, which was basically um, your annual salary divided by twelve divided by the number of days in a month, which was uh, very un which is what women are paid for maternity leave, I believe. Um, well, which is an NHS formula, but um, I think you can agree what you want to in terms of shared parental leave because there is no nationalized um, formula for anything to do with it. And the ACAS uh, documents regarding this are to just that you need to agree it in advance with your employer. Um, the things we also found important were to discuss who's going to arrange to cover your administrative work. There's a lot of uh, email correspondence you will still get when you're off um, and in terms of organizing everything from clinics to uh, patients to admin letters to uh, results that happen when you're off uh, and when you come back one of the most useful things in the support department was having a second consultant for certain operations so um, whether it was um, just when for example doing nephrectomies which is obviously a higher risk um, it was useful having somebody else doing it in terms of with you um, and for me particularly i, I for certain pediatric operations, just useful having a second consultant when you haven't been operating for quite a while. So I think it's just uh, any operation where you haven't done it for a significant amount of time, I think it's always useful even as a consultant to do that. Um, and in terms of keeping up to date, uh, these are the things that um, I found also useful to attend, which is generally just business meetings. So even if you just make an hour of the business meeting um, once a month, which is what we have, um, it's useful to know what's actually happening and what the issues are before you come back. Otherwise you sort of um, can be in complete shock or denial when you come back. Um, and then diary meetings obviously essential so you can plan what sessions you're gonna be having when you do come back and if anything's changed. Uh, if you can attend educational days or conferences, um, I found that really difficult, but I think it's, yeah, it's, if you can, it's good. And if it moves to virtual, uh, hopefully there'll be more chances for us to attend uh, conferences in a virtual form uh, and BJUI knowledge is obviously an excellent resource at the, at the moment. Uh, if you are doing any work, which you will do extra work when you're off, um, you should log it and log the days and how much you did. And uh, the other thing that's really frustrating is when you're off for any significant amount of time, all your IT passwords and access cards seem to be dis uh, often destroyed in some way. So try and get them restored before you start. Otherwise, you end up having uh, tense arguments with um, IT departments about doing clinics and you have no access to anything. <laughs> so it's just one of, the, one of the things I found really useful. And then we'll go, we'll go to questions at the end. Pippa, do you want to take us away? So hello, I'm um, Pippa Sangston. I'm going to just talk um, less about um, logistics and maybe a little bit more about um, <laughs> the emotional side of um, maternity leave. Uh, and just open talks. So um, maternity leave, I have a little bit of experience when it comes to maternity leave. So I've had four children. Um, over quite a short period of time and I had them almost all during my registrar training so I, I had my first baby uh, when I just um, uh, was finishing off my SHO training and about to go into research and I thought I'd just show you very quickly in terms of one thing that maybe you should think about not doing was the time between my, um, my, my four children so this is my youngest who in this photo was six months and then uh, the next one who was just over a year and then I had a little boy who was three and a half and a little girl who was 11 months older than him so um, one thing that we know that I did very badly was contraception so definitely wouldn't listen to me about anything like that but so four children four maternity leaves and I did lots of things wrong uh, and if I could go back in time then I would change quite a lot of it and, and I don't know whether you'd agree with me this is obviously just my opinion so you have to make a decision about what's right what's wrong for you 
Um, but I will say I, so I trained in South, um, South London and my trainees were all amazing. I did never ever had an, a slightest issue with any of my trainees who were amazing. Although this is one of my ISCP uh, pre-job <laughs> pre documents that my consultant wrote out. And I don't know if you can see number five was stop getting pregnant. I think that was after baby number four. Um, so, but I mean, that, that was as far as it got and was all done in a fairly jokey way. And actually, they were very supportive of my maternity leaves and very supportive for me coming back. Um, but as Charlie says, it's really important that you discuss it with your TPD, you discuss it with your trainees and they know what's going on um, and you can start to make plans. Um, so mistakes I made during maternity leave. So I would say the number one, the biggest problem for me was was probably being quite lonely. I was quite young when we had our first child. So I was 27. Um, so coming towards the end of surgical training and I was very career orientated at that point, but knew I wanted a big family and didn't have very many friends around me who were having babies. And definitely there was there was almost no female trainees at that point who were having babies. So I was one of the first ones who came out and I decided I definitely didn't need NCT, which sounded like a load of nonsense and I definitely didn't want to be sat with a group of women talking about breastfeeding and it was probably the biggest mistake I made so make friends um, join groups try and be with other women so you you aren't alone by yourself with a baby not really knowing what to do and not really having people at work who understood and not really people at home who understood so I would definitely go out there and try to meet as many people as you can. The second thing was research and degree aspirations and I'm sure every mum out there has said during my maternity leave I am going to write my thesis, I will publish that paper and I will write that, uh, <laughs> that document. You should just try and forget it, just enjoy your maternity leaves because it is so short. Um, I remember very little about my maternity leaves but one of, the, one of the clearest memories I had was when I'd had my first two children and I was doing the urology MSc and I had a newborn baby and I had a just about 12 month old baby. I was breastfeeding on one boob, expressing on the other boob and trying to revise for the MSc. And I remember just having a big cry, just thinking, what am I doing? Um, you don't need to do it. You really don't need to do it. And I think everyone feels like they really have to rush through training. And now I'm a consultant. I've been a consultant for a few years now. I will tell you, you do not need to rush. It's fairly hard on the other side um, and I know a lot of people feel it's probably going to be easier on the other side but you know don't rush it take your time put your papers put your research put your reading away and pick up some nice books um, and breastfeeding books and just throw yourself into maternity leave. I also think my maternity leaves are too short so I in general took six months I think one child I took five months and another child I took seven months and that was to make sure that, that I also started like Charlie said in the start or the finish time just because it made a lot more sense for jobs um, but there was, five months was definitely far too short for me and, and I really missed out on that. And you look at your children who grow up very quickly and I think oh, I, I should have spent, you know, a bit more time with, with each of them. And also, I suppose, because I had my baby so quickly and back to back, each maternity leave was, was very busy. So there was always a baby around and another baby that needed looking after. So a little bit more time and, and, and patience would have been good. Um, in terms of going forward, so childcare, I spoke to Tamsin Greenwell when I was just about to give birth to my second baby and I said, what do I do about childcare? What do you think the right thing to do is? And I think she gave me the best bit of advice and she said, throw money at the problem. Just throw all your money at the problem. And I've done that. Um, and I think obviously, again, you have to do what you feel comfortable with. But as a surgeon who needs to be at work at 7.30 to consent and get people ready, um, for theatre, I just it just never worked for me that that nursery was going to be an option. My husband is the same, and he also we fight about who gets out the door earlier in the morning. So for me to have a nanny who comes to your house at you know some ridiculously early hour, so you're not worrying about trying to pull on a child's nappy and trying to give them a bottle and get out the door to consent at the same time, it was just too stressful. So. Um, we've had an amazing nanny for many, many years now who um, has saved my bacon plenty of time. You just need to know there's someone at home with your children and you don't have to worry about dropping off and you don't have to worry about picking up. Otherwise, I think a surgical career can be quite tricky. So that for me has made the biggest difference. And then the last thing is what I call the Wonder Woman phenomena and how much I love it when people are like, oh, how do you do it for children and a job? And I bake my own bread and I clean my house. I'm trying to show you one of my boys' rooms just to show you how messy the house is. And we, we live in a mess and I don't bake my own bread. And I generally forget to pick up children from a play date or I don't have the right uniform or I've 
forgotten to buy someone's knickers. Um, so you just have to give yourself a break and understand there is no Wonder Woman phenomena. And you can try and be a really good surgeon and you can try and be a really good mum, but don't beat yourself up about the fact that maybe you're not the person you were going to be before you had children. You'll be a much better person in so many other ways, but it is a, a rejigging of your life. And I think each child you have, you have to reassess and accept the new you after six months what you can do and what you can't do and not beat yourself up about it too much because at the end of the day as long as your children are happy uh, and they're content and they feel loved that's all that matters to me and then the last little thing that someone said to me in fact a patient said to me one day because I said I was missing a, a child play and they said I'll never remember your name but your children will remind you of every school play you missed and they do so I have a 15 year old and a 14 year old and a nine and an eight year old now and they remember everything I miss so I would really you know think hard about taking those parental leaves take the dates be there don't miss those opportunities because the home opportunities are so important and, and you, you don't get them back so I think it's really important and that's me Thanks, everybody. Um, so this bit is really just for all of us to talk as four people who all have kids and at various different stages in training and, you know, all of the factors we've just discussed about. And one of the things that's come out a bit, and it's why it's, I'm kind of so pleased to have Eva here in a way, is because it's, it's not very common to come across um, a male surgeon who has taken parental leave in the way that you have. Um, and I suppose, you know, I, I kind of was wondering how you feel we try or whether we need to uh, even try to increase the likelihood of people wanting to do that and seek that out. Um, well, we've had to start with a contract, haven't we? As in, because ultimately, um, one of the reasons I was able to do it was because at the same time they had the problems with the annual allowance. And I was going to be over earning money because of the way that the trust were doing it. So, uh, one of so one of the key things for me was trying to earn less money that year, <laughs> as well as take leave. So I was like, well, um, it's a great opportunity to spend time with my son. Um, yeah. So, but I think it's 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 now in the junior contract that you have enhanced um, leave or enhanced parental leave, whereas the, the consultant contract still has no enhancement. So. Mm -hmm it's not in your financial interest to do it. And you've got to change that to have any sort of um, equality, I would say, not in terms of more for women, I would say, is you to enhance it for men so that both parents can have equality. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like there were a number of obstacles that you came across along the way. And it sounded a little bit reading between the lines that some of the advice and information and guidance was not necessarily that clear about what your rights were. Is that a correct kind of... Um, well, or? The, the summary is basically that we agreed that I would get paid for waiting list initiatives. I came back, did waiting list initiative lists where I just operated on my own, which isn't the point of doing split leave or kid right. days. I was just operating, doing lists on my own. And yeah. then the trust, when I came to claim those sessions back, they decided that that wasn't correct and we hadn't, we, that I should be paid on the same basis as maternity pay gets paid. Because they weren't paying me maternity pay, obviously. Um, and we had agreed that I would get paid waiting list initiatives. And, and kind of like, how did you go about negotiating that? Because obviously that's what the outcome was. But I mean... Oh, it just, as soon as they as soon as there was an email trail that basically came about so as soon as the email trail basically said this is the the situation we agreed on beforehand yeah. they they went back and said yeah that's fine we'll pay you but I, I it was it was more there was a lot of stress about it and also yeah. concerned me that they were calculating things in a very random way that we hadn't agreed so i think there's a lot of this because it's a lot of fine detail that's yeah. not very clear in in these leaves so i think it's important to just know some of the details so that you know what you're coming back to because HR didn't have a idea about it. I had to look it all up and then tell HR what the situation is. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, from what I gathered from that then, so actually it's about making sure you have clear documentation about what has already been discussed and agreed. And so that you can, you can reference that if there is a problem in the future. Um, okay, fine. Yeah, and definitely keep keep records of it definitely as in on emails just because you you'll forget as well because it's you have to give such a long period of notice and you're busy having kids yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and you're, yeah. you're changing nappies. You're like, I don't know what I discussed six months ago. Never mind yesterday. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's really, really important. Glad. I'm really glad that you brought up the, the parental leave aspect. that Because I had no idea that this existed either. And it sounds like it's not necessarily that well known about amongst a lot of people about this option to have 18 weeks of unpaid leave um, per child. And um, so I was interested to hear that. Thank you for raising that. Um, so to everyone else, really, I mean, sort of, what would you say to people who said that they struggled, like, uh, who, to people who were on maternity leave or paternity leave who were struggling? Where do they go if they're feeling a bit low or they're feeling like they don't know who they are anymore? What would you suggest that they do in those scenarios? Oh, Pippa, you I think it's really important that you surround yourself with fairly like-minded people in the different stages of your life. And so when we're working, it's really easy. You're in the operating room, you're in the theatre, you go to your training days, it's really straightforward. But actually, when you're at home with small children, um, and I, I'm guessing a really bad now in COVID era, era how, how do you meet people? And so that's why it's doing things like NCT, um, I used to do like psycho things like go to the park and just like try and talk to strangers um, <laughs> just try and look at people who had similar age children and meet that way which maybe not the most sensible but it is really lonely and I think as um, particularly as a woman in surgery um, you're different to your other friends to your other medical friends because your hours are long you, you work in a really stressful situation we can work with some, <laughs> some difficult people and then suddenly you put yourself in a situation with with maybe women who don't work anymore who are very orientated on their children and their family and your brain is constantly running at 100 miles on work children patients it's very difficult to find like-minded people and luckily there's a lot more female surgical trainees in urology coming so meet each other you know form little groups we have whatsapp groups my favourite WhatsApp groups are the, are the female WhatsApp uh, urology groups that um, Charlie and I are part of, uh, where you can, you know, just say I've had a really bad day because, you know, this has been hard or operating has been difficult or my kids are driving me up the wall. So make friends and talk to people. Amazing. Okay. Has anyone got any other comments or questions they'd like to be, ask any of the other speakers? Ivo, how can I get my husband to be like you? <laughs> Was, how do we encourage them? It's a similar thing, isn't it? I was thinking, yeah. how, how have you had four children? That's what I was saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's <Underwater>. she's <laughs> mad. She's mad, I know. Um, if I may, I, I might just say quickly, for if um, Pippa's totally right, there are lots and lots of... Um, more lots and lots more um, trainees out there who have children and the more that I've gone through um, training and, and um, finished training now but it, I've met more and more men who are like you're describing uh, thinking about they perhaps haven't done um, shared parental leave or taken a bunch of parental leave but there are more and more men who are um, you know are parents and are thinking about those things and are thinking more like they might like to and be able to, you know, a couple of days a week, do a drop off or a pick up or um, get to that school play. And I think the more that we talk about it and support each other and make it normal, I think the principle of what you were saying um, before, Ivor, is that for a lot of departments, they they don't they've never done this before, and they don't. There's no precedent for. No one's done it before. No one's had shared parental leave, and there are still female trainees who will rotate into departments, and you might be the first pregnant trainee they've ever had. So it's all that kind of principle that there are some they just don't know what to do with you, and so actually going with all the information which you can access. Um, e either through these sorts of forms, um, you know, that's why we're doing this sort of um, talk and presentation. Um, there's information on BAUS. Um, your deanery will have information. Talk to other trainees, talk to colleagues who've got children um, already and have done it before. And, you know, forewarned is forearmed. And then you can actually guide and get the most out of your um, parental leave that, you know, that you want and the most out of your job and your life ultimately because this is your life we're all going to be surgeons till we're 70 at this rate so we should enjoy it every aspect of it 
I, I think completely agree. And in addition to the sort of all of those groups, you know, there is the BMA as well. They are often very helpful. It's the most I have used my membership, I think, ever. Um, and um, I should probably just say there is a, a group on Facebook. Uh, lots of people are not interested in being part of these groups and they sometimes can make you go a little bit mad, but there's something called a Physicians Mums Group, which is actually quite a good resource for things like issues that you're having at work um, and, and even simple things like um, my, rash has, my child has a rash, which is, um, you know, lots of things like that. Um, but it can be very helpful um, advice and it's all doctors on there or healthcare professionals and can often be very interested. Um, any other comments for any, anyone? No. Uh, I, I would say one more thing. Sorry, I, I know I just spoke a second ago, but I didn't mention about um, risk assessment in Oki Health. That's um, something I would say uh, pregnant ladies should know about because if you are having issues in your department because you're the first one, they don't really know what to do. Um, the way to be belt and braces about it is to go to, along to your Oki Health department and be risk assessed. Um, and by that, that's if you um, if you have a really straightforward pregnancy and if everyone's pregnancy is different, then you may not need or want to change anything about your duties. It depends how crazy you're on call rotor is and things like that. But if you are struggling, you've got bad morning sickness, you've got, you know, you've got hyperemesis and that's dragging on um, or you've had a lot of trouble conceiving. You know, this is an IVF baby and uh, you, you or you've had a stillborn before you could have had all sorts of horrible disasters and you don't want to do certain aspects of the job you it's not unreasonable for you to go and talk and discuss that with Rocky Health and then and then with your trainers and and TPD so there is a lot of support for that if you are if it's not the most straightforward thing for you being pregnant yeah absolutely that's their role that's what they're there for yeah so definitely um, well thank you all very much for all of your wisdom all of your talks and sharing all of your experiences we're all very grateful um, there will be some questions on the chat on the live session and we will try to answer as many of those as we can do um, the next speaker uh, will be Melissa Davies and she'll be doing our concluding talk um, and she'll be following on next thank you very much everybody good morning my name is Melissa Davis and I'm delighted to have been asked by Katie uh, to talk to you about some of my experiences as being both a consultant urologist and a mother. So, as I said, my name is Melissa Davis and I work in Salisbury Hospital and the Duke of Cornwall's Spinal Treatment Centre, but I'm also known as Jessie and Rosie's mum. So this morning we've had some great talks and I've learned ever so much already. And I do wish that I'd had the opportunity to attend this session 13 years ago when it all began. And I perhaps uh, would have had a slightly easier time of it. In preparing for this talk, I uh, did some research on the internet um, as I'm sure everyone does. Um, and initially Katie had asked me to talk about having it all. And I thought, well, that's a ridiculous because none of us have it all. Um, but I thought, well, I'll have a look at what having it all and being a parent means. And I was very pleased to come across this quote uh, from an American authoress of the book, Forget Having It All, because I thought that kind of summed it up a bit better. And she very succinctly said, we're expected to work like we don't have children and raise children like we don't work. And I think that really does sum up uh, some of the feelings and the difficulties uh, that working parents have. And there's for a number of problems uh, being both a parent and a surgeon uh, presents itself with some very special uh, difficulties and I think this morning we've had some great talks as to how to overcome some of those difficulties, um, how to get around some of those difficulties because it's not always possible to overcome them um, and also um, some really practical tips on how your TBD and the School of Surgery are able to help and what the rules and regulations are about uh, parental leaves and all the different types of leaves that we are able to have. So I did some more research on the internet and if you've ever put in be a more organised mum or tips for mums, you'll come across a plethora of information. Uh, and I have to say, I found the majority of it to be absolute guff. Uh, it was the first website that said, become a super organized mum. It recommended getting a book to write things down in, develop a cleaning schedule, uh, because that would be one of your top things to do uh, when you're running around trying to be on call as a urologist and look after your children and sort everything else out. 
And there was another website that had some essential daily self-care practices. And, and this rather delightful lady was extolling us all to get up a bit earlier, because if you had some more time in your day, you could get some more done. It did make me wonder whether going to bed was actually a bit of a waste of time and perhaps I could just stay up 24-7 to get all those uh, essential chores done. She also advised us to make ourselves look nice because when mummies look nice then they, they feel better and it would be lovely to loll around in the bath for a couple of hours every morning. I'm not sure that's going to get me up out the door and off to work on time. Um, it then came on to talking about commuting. Now there are different types of commute. There's the London commute, which is really sniffing someone else's armpit on a stuffed tube or bus or train where you're lucky if you can get a sit down. And there's the out of London commute, which normally involves driving somewhere in your car as quickly as you can because you're always just five minutes too late. But apparently this is very useful time and we could use this to organise our lives. I'm not quite sure I agree with this, uh, but I'm just uh, giving you the benefit of my internet research. And finally, there are the websites that have pictures of really lovely, glamorous mummies, beautiful, clean children, often in yoga wear, uh, posing for the camera. And I have to say, uh, this is distinctly unhelpful because the vast majority of us, even if we had a couple of days to get ready for one of these photo shoots, couldn't hope to look like these gorgeous ladies. So my experience of childhood so far is I have two girls, one age 13 and one age 10. And the first stage is what I call the early years. This is like from birth to three. And I have to say, this is probably the most difficult phase. So if you're at this point at the minute, please don't give up. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel it does get a little bit easier. You can negotiate with them slightly better when they have a better vocabulary set. It's an emotional roller coaster. There are highs and lows, first steps, first words, um, but also sleepless nights, sleep deprivation, uh, vomit on your clothes, um, and feeling that constant need to be in more than one place at the same time. This often coincides with professional exams. And I know it's best that if you're not uh, uh, doing exams, but there's no way around this. I mean, this is just life and we just have to get on with it as best we can. And we often end up spending more or almost as much on childcare and commuting as we do uh, in terms of earning. Um, and Pippa's already mentioned earlier on about the um, benefits of having excellent childcare, throwing money at the problem, as she describes it, to have an excellent nanny. And this is indeed what I did. Uh, but it does leave you with a significant dent in the bank balance. And you do sometimes wake up thinking, I've probably earned enough for my um, latte habit this month. Is this really worth it? But things do get better. They do eventually get a bit bigger and they go to school. Now, this for some people can be a dilemma and it kind of depends on where you live. And this is one of the reasons we chose to move out of London, that's to have better childcare, uh, better schools that were easier with less stress. And it is at this age that I say your children need you the most. They need you for things like school plays, the nativity, um, sports day, and don't underestimate the effect on your children if you're routinely missing these important events. And there's also what I call the school admin. And there's a whole plethora of it. So it's not just the fixed school social calendar. There'll be endless days where you have to remember to dress your child up as a character from a book, send them in with a pound, have made some cakes for a cake sale and all sorts of other things. And these happen on almost weekly basis and it's bewildering. Um, and you just have to have a mechanism for keeping on top of this. Uh, whatever it is, a chalkboard or some sort of electronic device that pings and reminds you. But there are some other top tips. Gather a network of like-minded parents. The number of times I've had my bacon saved by texting so-and-so, can you take Rosie to tennis? Oh, I've forgotten to send her in with a pound. Could you quickly give um, your daughter a pound to give to my daughter? And also paying back the favours because you can't expect people to help you if you're not able to help them. Befriend your admin team. The number of times that I've forgotten about the nativity starts at one, but so does my clinic. Have a nice chat with one of my friendly admin ladies, and all of a sudden my patients are miraculously moved into my morning admin slots um, with no managers knowing, no telling off, and my clinic just runs at a different time. And it's really important that these people are on your side and you keep them on your side. 
But despite being super organized, loving work, having high energy levels, two years ago, I felt like this poor lady here. I was absolutely exhausted with it all. And I decided that I had to change. Something had to change. And why change? Well, burnout is a very real uh, problem and it is getting more so uh, within people practicing medicine in hospitals. It's a syndrome of physical and mental exhaustion caused by work-related stress. It gives you feelings of reduced the personal accomplishment, nothing's ever good enough, uh, and depersonalization, feeling just so dreadfully tired about the thought of having to go in and do an e a day's work. And there are risk factors for this and they're well-documented risk factors. So some of them, as you can see in the list below, so high weekend on call rates. I work in a DGH, I do a one in five. So yes, tick. Having a leadership role. Well, I'm clinical lead for our urology department. So tick to that too. Female, I can't change that. So yes, tick. Surgical specialty, tick. And I am, at my own admission, a bit of a perfectionist. So I'm driving my own problem. So it was recognizing that I had a problem. Uh, and one of my very good uh, colleagues suggested I do the BMA burnout score which I duly completed. And I came in the purple category, which looked like I was just about to have some meltdown. Genuinely didn't feel quite that bad. But anyway, the benefit of doing something like that was it gave me something to take to our managers to say, look, this is what's going on. This is how I'm feeling. And I really do need to change my working week. And can you help me with that? Now, I have to say, um, some people have had excellent experiences of working with their managers, and mine was a bit hit and miss. But eventually, uh, we did manage to get there. I did manage to make some changes uh, to my working week, allowing me to have a whole day off every week, the same day. It took me about six years of uh, working within the organisation to get that change, but it was a change that I really needed. And it allowed me to reflect that parenthood had given me some very real life skills. And I shouldn't be ashamed to admit that as a working woman and a mother, that I'm not the same person that I was 13 years ago when I didn't have any children. But working gives you some enormously beneficial skills. So patience. So if you've ever had to sit outside the pool, the ballet class, the tap class for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you learn patience. You find a way to occupy yourself physically or mentally whilst waiting for your children to come out of the uh, activities. Empathy, there is no one that's had a child that isn't more empathetic afterwards. Of course you are, your child falls over, you naturally want to run to pick them up and to comfort them. And those feelings of wanting to comfort people um, extend into other members of uh, either your team or looking after patients. Resilience, you know, there is not a single parent listening to this talk today that isn't more resilient after having had children. I mean, we've heard from Lizzie Chandra, not just having children, but having children with, you know, health problems that has probably made her one of the more resilient amongst all of us. And adaptability, you know, we underestimate our, our, uh, our ability to change and to work around a problem but I think again uh, having a busy household to run as well as a busy work life uh, gives you those skills and these are all excellent leadership qualities and qualities that we would want to see in our own doctors and healthcare providers so I think we shouldn't step back from or be ashamed that if we're being uh, interviewed for leadership roles or giving advice or mentoring that we draw on these experiences and we give other uh, doctors the benefits of our experiences um, in terms of their career progression as well. So I've got some top tips and I kind of sum them up. My trainees always laugh and they call them Melissa-isms. Well, these are some that pertain to parenthood. I've, I've kept my urological ones for another talk and another day. So get a cleaner or a gardener or an ironing lady, someone to help you with the jobs that you simply don't really want or like doing. And this is nothing to be ashamed of. It's not that you can't cope. It's just that I don't particularly like cleaning bathrooms, particularly the bathrooms that I don't use. So I pay someone to do that. And you need to offload some of these duties. You need to get a hobby or a personal trainer or join a group. Everyone needs time. And I would put it at two to three hours per week of doing something for themselves. So that can be going to the gym, going for a swim, meeting a friend for a coffee. It should be ideally outside of home and work. 
and you are not to feel guilty for having these two to three hours to yourself to do something that you particularly enjoy. Think about attending some coaching. Most hospitals now offer this as a service uh, for staff. Uh, it's normally you refer yourself. Um, I actually have to say that I was a little bit unconvinced, but after a couple of sessions with a very excellent coach, I learned some important things about myself, but also about how to manage other people. There are sometimes people that we have to interact, interact with on a professional level who we struggle with. And it's learning why we struggle with them and some tips to get around that, to make communication better, to make you a better communicator, but also a better professional. Learn to say no to others' demands. You haven't got to please everyone all of the time. You know, your children want to go and have a play date or a sleepover. You know, it, it's all right to say no. Your manager wants you to do an extra clinic because there's a lot of referrals waiting in the system and to come in on a Saturday and do something or other. And it's all right to say no. I always used to have a handy uh, sort of list of excuses that I would give. Oh, I've got tickets to the ballet. I've got something else on. But now I just simply... I just say no I don't need to explain myself to other people I don't need to give an excuse unfortunately it's not convenient uh, to do that this weekend uh, maybe another time and that's it end of conversation and finally I would say that you've got to have goals now I'm a rather sad middle-aged woman so I gave myself the goal of being able to do a pull-up at the gym so I will just share this with you because I think it's quite funny um, because my goals are not what anyone else would think they would be. So here I am on the pull-up bar. I might have sped up the video a bit to make me look a bit cooler, uh, but there we are. And that's it.